bit late, by the way. Uh, Charles Booker, good to good to see you, man. How you been? Man, I'm doing well, man. It's good to see you all. It's good to be back, man. I, you know, I, since since I talked to you all last time, I've had another baby. Yes, uh, oh, I was oh, just awesome. gonna say that. Congratulations, a daughter, right? Yep, yep. So three girls, man. I'm completely outnumbered. You're gone. Oh. Never, you'll never win. I know. I, <laughs> look, I got the grades to to prove it. They're coming in. Yeah, um, it's, it's the best thing in the world, though, man. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's really yeah. really cool. How how's that been like? Uh, uh, managing, you know, three girls on the campaign trail. I'm sure you you get like no <laughs> sleep. Man, it's it's really exhausting. Um, I'll just say that <laughs> it's yeah. as tiresome as it is. It reminds me why I do what I do. You know, because um, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, where I'm traveling across Kentucky, if I'm going around the country to tell people quit ignoring Kentucky. When I get home, <laughs> all the girls know is your dad sit down, play with these dolls with me, carry me around the house, um, or come change this diaper, as my, my wife would say. So that's right. Uh, it, it keeps me grounded and reminds me why I do what I do. So I that's love a good it. indicator. Good indicator of uh, strong politicians have to have strong, significant others. And obviously your wife, uh, Aunt Charles, she may be stronger than you. OK, I'm not going to lie to you. I won't there really that. is no question in that. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm very clear on who is the boss. I'm thankful for, it. and man, you know my my wife is, she's the type of person she takes no BS, um, and she doesn't like politics, and so <laughs> we're we're perfect for one another because she's yeah. always making sure that I'm seeing something or not missing something, and you know she told me she believes in me, and. She joins the Commonwealth people that are sick and tired of Rand Paul. And so um, I would not be here and able to do this if my wife wasn't standing beside me. So it's thank so you, true. Tanisha. Uh, look, this is like a late Valentine's Day bill of love. Here, so, uh, <laughs> That's I true. appreciate y'all setting it up. Uh, for yeah, there you go. Just, I'm pretty sure we just dedicated this episode. That's right, man. <laughs> <laughs> Looking nice. out for it. Thank you. Yeah, we try. <laughs> You know, there's there's so many things we could talk about. I I, I love that you reference pe uh, uh, lecturing people on to stop ignoring Kentucky. I want to. I definitely want to get to that. Uh, first thing, though, I'm kind of curious. You've um, you launched your campaign. Uh, I think it was later last year, uh, if I remember correctly. Forgive me if I if I forget. But where have you where have you been since then? Like where where have you gone around in Kentucky? Who have you talked to? What are the things you're hearing from Kentuckians? You know, since we launched the campaign, uh, which we launched in July, you know, I was in exploratory uh, a couple months before that. Um, I've gone to every corner of Kentucky uh, at least a couple of times. Now, I, I did this in my previous run, too, you know, before um, I really wrote out many of my policies. I wanted to do more listening than talking. Um, we have a lot of people that run for office that uh, don't pay attention to us at all. Um, especially, you know, communities like mine. And that's where from the hood to the holler really was this rallying cry for me because I'm really sick and tired of that. And, you know, going from Pikeville to Paducah and, and really just crisscrossing the state to sit down and listen to folks. Um, the themes that really jumped out for me, one, you know, just dealing with this pandemic, a lot of folks are have been struggling to see like how they're going to keep food on the table, how they're going to take care of their families, what's the future going to look like, you know, and uncertain about, you know, all these things that are dealing with COVID. Everyone's tired of COVID. Um, and then there's the reality that, you know, Kentucky and, and, and as you all have seen in the, the last few months of the year with the storms that hit, um, yeah. our infrastructure and the resources that are allocated to a lot of our communities, um, we've just really been left behind. And, you know, things have been crumbling. Internet is crap. Roads, bridges need repair. Um, jobs that have left communities and never come back. A lot of these things are what I hear from folks. And, and the thing that I've also heard a lot is people are, si are the tired of the division. People are tired of the dysfunction and, you know, all of the, the hatred um, that has really been weaponized by people like the guy that I am going to be replacing in November. And so um, Kentuckians are ready for change. It's not a partisan thing. Um, it is in earnest. We're trying to survive 
and we're looking for someone who gives a damn about us thing. And that's why I'm running this race. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Um, you mentioned that people are tired of division, and I feel like that's certainly not even exclusive to Kentucky, uh, but I think the entire country to an extent is. How do you thread that needle uh, by respecting that and not wanting to be divisive, but also contrasting yourself with Rand Paul? You know, it's it's a lot of work because Rand Paul gives you <laughs> a lot to talk about. Um, and, and every he day he's sowing division. And one of the most important parts of my work, but all of us is, you know, as, as truth tellers, as people that care about our communities, is you got to call out the bullshit. Um, mm -hmm. And so it requires me um, to make it clear that, you know, this guy is voting to block your health care. He's voting against disaster relief. You know, he's blocking relief in a pandemic. But we have to tell a story that's big than that, you know, and we have to inspire people to believe things can be different. We got to meet them where they are and listen to folks and actually lift up a vision that is more than just beating a terrible politician. Um, because we're used to terrible politicians, to be honest with you. And, and a lot of folks have sort of resigned to concluding that's all we're going to have. And I don't blame folks for that. And so as much as I don't like Rand Paul, I'm not doing this because I don't like him. I'm doing this because I love Kentucky. This is about us. And if we can tell that story and lift up the issues people really, really care about instead of the wedges that drive us apart, we'll build a coalition to win this race and, and much more. See, that's the important part. I think right now there are too many Democrats who are running for office, not because of the policies that they want to put forth, but because the other person across the aisle who's running. And I think right. that people can see through that and see them as, you know, phonies. And that's part of what is hurting the Democratic Party right now, which I think leads me to my my question is, how do you separate yourself from the National Democratic Party that has this kind of, um, you know, they're kind of looked down upon when it comes to rural Kentucky, you know, all these rural areas. How do you separate yourself? You know, uh, it really, again, it goes back to, understanding our common bonds and realizing that we have so much more in common than we do otherwise and leaning into that. So I'm not running a campaign that is built to defend Democrats. I'm not running a campaign that is built to tear down Republicans. I'm running a campaign that's focused on the issues that we're dealing with and how we fight for change together. And, you know, by empowering and inspiring more folks to do that too. So we got a big base of volunteers that are organizing with us. And these are folks that voted for Trump. They voted for Bernie Sanders. They've never voted before. It's this big coalition of over 13,000 folks across Kentucky to this point um, that we are training to talk to their family, friends, neighbors, church members about like, what's pissing you off? Like, what do you care about? And I've launched this initiative, this vision called a Kentucky New Deal, which is really saying, I want us to transform our future and complete the promise um, that was uh, made with the New Deal of ending poverty and investing in infrastructure and, you know, really helping to support communities across the country. And how do we do that together? You know, coal miners that are talking about those jobs that are gone, you know, and talking about what, what it means to have black lung and to not have health care. And it's like when you do that stuff, um, the partisan divides really sort of fall to the wayside. And we just need to do a lot of that. It's a lot of organizing early. Um, so for me, GOTV starts, um, actually it started a couple months ago. So through the rest of this campaign, uh, that's how we're going to treat it. Awesome. But I think that's a smart thing to do. What about you, Chuck? No, I think it's a terrible, terrible plan. Could never work. That's no, I'm why, kidding. That's why I set Chuck up. I knew he was, was going to be so, uh, you know, divisive. So uh, that's yeah, yeah. Gonna... That's like, I'm going <laughs> to throw barbs there. No, I do think it's a good idea. Um, so I'm kind of curious how you're you're navigating the issue of the pandemic right now, because at one point, you know, I feel like we're kind of in a weird sort of limbo area with the pandemic. We have, as a country, figured out in some ways how to manage it, but we have so many constituent groups like nurses and first responders and factory workers who are still facing the brunt of the pandemic while others like myself that are more fortunate can work remotely, don't really get the impact of it. 
how are you messaging that to different people? How How is your campaign approaching the pandemic from a policy standpoint? And how are you contrasting that with Rand Paul, who, um, you know, in my my sense is really just trying to politicize certain players in the pandemic? Yeah. Um, you know, that's that last point is really important because what Rand Paul is doing, particularly with Dr. Fauci, he's really fun, he, he has picked someone that he can go to battle with not because he cares about the pandemic or cares about us getting through it, but because he can divert away from the fact that he doesn't want to do anything. Like it, it gives him another show to put on. It's, it's entertainment. It's like all of this is a joke. And, you know, the way that we are approaching um, this pandemic, quite honestly, um, is the way that I've approached my politics before the pandemic hit. Um, you know, coming from the West End of Louisville, a place that it has generational poverty, you know, um, industries that have left a long time ago, um, no places to really get, you know, healthy food. Uh, we got a lot of dollar stores, a lot of liquor stores, but not a lot of uh, local businesses that have been able to sustain, especially during this pandemic. Um, I'm pushing on the policies that I believe can ultimately end poverty and allow us to be prepared for the next pandemic, the next storm, you know, and making the deep investments in communities that will allow us to do what we need to do um, to take care of our families and to be safe. And the the pandemic has really just shined a light on like what it would mean for everybody to have health care, for instance. Because if you, you lose your job, you're losing your health care, now you're on, you know, folks are saying, well, wait a minute, what do I do now? I can't afford insulin. And, and when the, uh, the tornado hit and everything was wiped out in parts of Kentucky, um, the governor you know, declared it, you know, a state of emergency and put provisions in place so people could get their prescription. And it calls in the question, why are we always making sure people can get their prescription? You know, and so the the frontline workers, essential workers who have always been essential, it's allowed us to talk about the importance of unions and raising wages and, and policies like universal basic income, where folks can have more financial freedom, um, actually have a savings, um, and be ready when when tough times come. And so the the main thing that I'm trying to do here is give people the room to be frustrated, though. You know, mm -hmm. it's, this is not about um, judging or being uh, annoyed with folks that want this thing to go away. I don't blame anyone for not wanting to wear a mask or not wanting to get vaccinated. None of us really want to deal with this. Um, but it takes leadership to say, all right, how do we actually get through this damn thing so we can get past it um, mm -hmm. and keep our loved ones safe? And, you know, because we're doing this, so our campaign's actually been doing check-in calls. So we've had our volunteers call areas across Kentucky, not just Democratic areas, to just say, you know, how are you doing? Uh, you know, have, has your family been sick? Do you need any resources? We love you. It's the type of stuff you don't really hear from campaigns too often. And yeah. because we're doing that, um, the coalition is growing in a way that, again, it's, it's bigger than beating Rand Paul. And truthfully, we're, we've taken pages from Mitch McConnell's playbook because we're organizing in areas that Republicans take for granted. It's a winning playbook. <laughs> it's a winning playbook. And, and, and let's say we use it to not build power from one evil person, but we actually empower the people. Radical yeah, idea. Yeah, I love it. Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool idea there, Charles. <laughs> yeah, um, doing what Mitch McConnell does and winning, but then actually not being a terrible person. I love it, uh, and I'm glad that you're. I'm glad that you're doing that because I think that that's smart, and Democrats have to be smart in order to beat these people. Um, I like your approach to to this to the pandemic, especially like giving people the space to be frustrated. Because yeah. I think too often, number one, campaigns come off as way too transactional of like, I'll say whatever you want to get your vote, or they're not nuanced enough. And and to be honest, the pandemic has affected so many people in terrible ways, but such different ways. So I think that that's a really smart approach. And one thing that you mentioned with the unions is something that I really wanted to ask you and hit on, because I feel like we are very much in the middle of a massive labor rights movement in our country that I feel like at the national level is kind of getting ignored. It's gotten a little bit of traction. I feel like the national Democrats have largely not capitalized on it or supported it enough, save people like Sherrod Brown. 
Um, mm-hmm. What like what are you hearing from people who are organizing unions or who are members of unions or just in the working class? Like, and how are you planning to support those people? Because I'm just blown away at like just the massive amount of movements toward organizing unions and union votes. And some of them have been extremely successful. Some of them have been almost successful. You look at Starbucks, you look at, you know, Kellogg's, all these places. And and so I'm just kind of curious your take on that and how you plan on, on addressing those issues for folks. Yeah, man. You know, I think there's a couple of realities here. One, you're seeing this, this growing demand from the people um, to be heard and to be, accounted for and so you're seeing uh more folks like you had mentioned with starbucks and, and amazon these folks that are saying all right you're not gonna keep screwing us uh we're gonna lift our voices together and so there's this demand for it um but organized labor has really been undermined uh tremendously over the years oh and, yeah you know we've we've had some some hard fights in the state legislature during my time there uh trying to uh, protect organized labor and, and and strengthen it and so you know, the and things like the PRO Act that a lot of folks have uh, been pushing that I certainly support and giving our uh, unions and, and folks who want to join unions a fighting chance. Um, what I'm trying to do in this campaign in helping to strengthen organized labor is really talk about the power of community by lifting up the stories that, that people have, uh, just in general, from different walks of life, um, including in organized labor. So. Through the campaign, as I mentioned, these 13,000 plus volunteers, uh, we're training people to be issue based organizers um, Mm -hmm. and to be relational organizers. And this is a powerful tool that our partners in organized labor um, are utilizing and digging into more of because, you know, if you're trying to tell a story, it can't always just be, all right, you need to support unions. Right. People need to know the why and, and the how and the history and what's going on right now. And we take for granted the fact that most people don't realize how they're being screwed. And so some of the organizing is, do you know that if you had representation that was protecting you here, you, uh, you know, you'd be able to save more money, you'd get better benefits in your health coverage, um, you know, your projects, um, construction projects uh, would last longer, uh, schools would be safer, all these different types of things that if we're just training folks, look, on these days a week, talk about these issues. Tell your loved ones about this. Let them know what's going on. Um, that type of work is is going to be really key. And you know, we're actually organizing um, um, within our campaign. So I'm gonna have some news um, soon. That I'm Ooh, very excited. Very exciting. Uh, so I'll make sure that you all are some of the first to know. Y'all got to help us blast this out. Uh, but, well. This is a campaign that really is for the people. Um, there's no point in doing this otherwise. And organized labor is at the heart of that, man. And, and so we we got to fight to make it really count for everyone. And a lot of communities that uh, haven't really had the chance to to organize or be accounted for in labor. We we need we're pushing for that now. And so we're getting a lot of support from unions because one, the work I've done over the years, but two, what we're doing in this campaign. And it's just another reason why we're going to win this race. Well, we're all excited for that news. I know it, it will be monumental and we will blast it through the airways. Uh, yes. I always say that every politician has a day one, which by that I mean not the first day that they go into office, but a day one issue that they want to focus on as soon as they step in the door. So let's say, you know, Senator Charles Booker becomes a reality. What's your day one? Man, my day one has to be the same day one I had when I won the state house and it's voting rights, protecting the access to the ballot box and making sure more people can be heard. Um, You know, Kentucky has historically been one of the more disenfranchised states in the country. Um, It has been disproportionately hard to be heard here. Um, And, you know, right now in our country, with all of the attacks on democracy, we're still trying to figure democracy out as a country Um, and we haven't gotten it right. And and we're hanging on by a thread now, you know, and so um, protecting those rights, getting big dark money out of politics so that regular folks can be heard to me is the foundation. Cause then after that, every other issue that we're dealing with, we need to make sure people can be heard and and, and engage in them. And so uh, sure enough, democracy to me is, is day one. That's what we gotta be fighting. If we got to get rid of the filibuster, 
so be it. You know, we need to expand the Supreme Court because uh, Mitch McConnell's packed it up. So be it. We got to get this job done uh, to protect our future. Yeah, I like <clears throat> I think right now politicians, especially on the Democratic side, which I know it seems like we shit on Democrats a lot. But to be fair, we are Democrats and and we've run a you know campaign on it. So we understand a little bit about it. But it, it seems like Democrats are afraid to talk about some of those issues. For instance, mm -hmm. a lot of high profile Democrats refuse to talk about the reality of the Supreme Court and what could happen in terms of, you know, adding a justice or whatever, you know, could take place. So I do think it's important that you actually do talk about those issues. And I commend you for that because that's not happening everywhere. Yeah. So now the tougher question is, and this is probably what our listeners are, you know, wondering, because last time when we talked to you, uh, you know, you're running against Mitch McConnell at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously that didn't work out. What makes this campaign different than that one? What makes this one successful? So the, the biggest difference between this campaign and the last one is we're not starting from ground zero. You know, we had to really introduce this idea um, the, the notion that a, a black person from the hood that doesn't have a lot of money, um, uh, could run a viable campaign, um, was really laughed at, like literally laughed at. And because of what we did in the last cycle, the organizing that we did in, in Appalachia and in, in areas that, like I said, Democrats like, don't even go there, Charles. Um, there's a lot of, there's more Confederate flags than there are Democratic voters. Um, that work really helped to transform our expectations and so when we launched this race we we had immediate support and you know essentially have a clear feel um you know because a, a lot of the support has gathered behind us early and so it gives us a chance to tell the story from the beginning um what we did in the last you know month or so where we closed the gap in that primary run and folks were surprised by it uh was just scratching the surface of what we can do if we invest in organizing and listen to folks in areas that we've given up on, the forgotten places. And, and here's the thing, too. Um, first of all, we would have blown Mitch McConnell out. So let me be clear on that. And Mitch McConnell knows this, too. Um, but there's a difference. As much as Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul are like two sides of the same just horrible coin, um, Rand Paul is not Mitch McConnell in terms of he doesn't have infrastructure. Um, he does not have the respect um, and support that Mitch McConnell has because Mitch McConnell has, he's played the game. Look, he has buildings named after him. He was, he's been out since I was born, actually, like literally, like when I was born. Um, and Rand Paul is really just seen as a joke across the board. And so we have a very real path here that we have the time and the support to do. Um, this is still a grassroots campaign. I'm still, um, not the, the Democrats darling, if you will. Uh, so we're not building this leaning on like the DSCC or anything like that. But honestly, it's telling an even more powerful story because, you know, nearly half of the support that we've received is from Kentucky. And the fact that we have, you know, right at 100,000 contributions, every county in Kentucky, every state, um, and we haven't done any ads, any national buys, and we still are seeing all this growing support is because we're doing the real work. And uh, if Rand Paul is smart, which is a question, he should be terrified um, because this is the work that all the hate cannot be. Well, I will say this feels like a totally different campaign. Last time it felt like, you know, you were the underdog coming in, you know, especially in the, in the primary, because you're getting, you know, you have, you're going up against somebody who has name recognition and a lot of money, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This feels different. I compare your campaign to the Cincinnati Bengals, right? You, you will be headed to the Super Bowl, but not everybody thought that a couple right. years ago. Right. Yeah. But, but this time I, I think it is. So uh, I will say it does feel a lot different. It feels much more, um, I won't even say it, not professional, but just like a well-oiled machine. That that's what it seems like. Like you've built this. It's like the industrial revolution of campaigns. Yeah, man. Look, my so both my parents are ministers, and you know, my mom's all, always says that nothing happens by mistake. And you know, the work that we were able to do, and then after the last election, I launched an organization called Hood to the Holler, and we 
you know, I've told you all about that and it's still going on. So I've stepped back from it, but they still just had an, uh, a political training with hundreds of folks uh, from across Kentucky, uh, training folks to run for office and uh, to work on campaigns. It's like we, we were able to open the door in a way that not only now is it me running as the top of the ticket um, in an unexpected type of way, but we're inspiring other people to run, you know, at the state and local level. And to me, that's the real victory. And, you know, we have a vision, we have a mission. It requires us to go through Rand Paul, but that's what we'll do. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so I have one last question that I know John wants to wrap on the, on the wrestling one. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so what's your what's your plea i guess or case that you make to rural voters who have largely been ignored by democrats because we know that at least at the national level democrats have often ignored rural america what's your what's your case that you make for them it, it, you know if, if a voter it doesn't have to be a rural area but particularly rural americans who maybe be more predisposed to vote for someone like Rand paul yeah you know first of all to any any of my family because everywhere I go, like we're, we're connected. So these are my family I'm talking about is you have a right to be pissed off with Democrats. You have a right to feel like nothing's going to change. You've been ignored and left behind. Your jobs have left. You've been called deplorable. You've been disrespected. You've been demeaned. You've been mocked. And I'm here to say, I see you because I feel that too. I'm sick and tired of it too. And I'm not asking for support because of my party registration. I'm asking for support because of the work that I'm here to do and the work that I've put in and the fact that I am showing in this campaign that my priority is them. Um, at the end of the day, I don't want anyone to have to ration their insulin. I want people to be safe in their homes. I don't want folks feeling like the, the government is over their shoulder blocking them from living a good life by giving all their money to these big corporations. I want you to have clean water and clean air. You know, I want your utilities to be uh, low and not breaking your, your bank or you have to go without water or without lights because you can't afford it, you know? And, and by leading with that type of campaign and folks on the fact that I, I, I love Kentucky. I, I love folks in the hollers. I love folks on, in, in rural communities. I love folks in my hood because I see Kentucky as like one of the best places on the planet, you know, and I think everybody that steps up to represent um, their community should feel like that about their community. You know? totally. um, the most important thing I'm saying is give us a chance, give this a chance. If you don't believe you're cynical, I don't blame you. Take this chance and I promise you we can win this and transform our future. I think that's a good plea. And I think it makes sense too. I mean, honestly, you know, you're not a, uh, you know, you're a guy who has the means to get up and leave and be gone. I mean, you could have left, right. But you're not going to, because you love Kentucky. And to be honest, most people who run for office and lose are always looking for a way out of wherever they just lost. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've seen it in West Virginia <laughs> just recently. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot. John Racy, great, great example. I mean, there's, there's plenty on both sides and, and uh, it's one of those things. So I, uh, I do think it's good that you're coming back. You're giving it another shot. You have a different opponent this time. And it seems like you're, you got your eye focused on the, the prize. I remember before we wrap with that wrestling story, which I think is going to be great and our listeners are going to love it. Um, I do remember Daniel Kirk was on our show and she was speaking to us about, being excited about your campaign, but she was worried at the time that you hadn't been in her community yet. But it seems like now you've got the ball rolling. You're everywhere when it comes to even, you know, the most rural areas of Kentucky. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so we've actually launched our uh, second wave of, of tours across Kentucky. So, um, and look, a lot of people didn't know this, but for a few weeks um, I had COVID mm. and so did my entire household. Um, oh goodness. So, even our five month old daughter. And so going into the end of the year, we had to pull a lot of um, trips off the calendar, you know, to, so I can get back on my feet and make sure we're not getting anyone sick. Um, but we've actually launched our, our second wave of our tour. Uh, so um, I'll be traveling. I'll, I'll actually be in Moorhead um, this week and making a couple stops out east. And we're going back 
uh, towards Paducah and, and uh, having a couple stops out there next week. Um, we're going to be crisscrossing the state. And for anyone that wants to loop in with that um, or help us, if you want to host an event, I'll come anywhere. Uh, go to charlesbooker.org um, and sign up. We're doing meetups. So we have county meetups and we're, we're close to getting every county covered, but we still need some help. Um, so I definitely don't want anyone feeling like we haven't seen them or connected with them because we need them. So. Well, that that's great to hear. I think you're doing a good job. And I think, you know, you've got, you still have time to, even if you, you know, if you haven't been places, I know you will be. That's what it sounded like. And speaking of being places, recently, I, I look, I heard this while we were getting ready to start this interview, and I've never been more excited in my entire life. You were recently a manager at yep. Ohio Valley Wrestling. So you got to, you were right there ringside, right? That's right, man. Like I said, I, I even got it. I even got in the ring. Yeah. Uh, it was like bucket list uh, <laughs> for me. Yeah. So um, one of my brothers, Matt Jones, uh, who's also been oh, yeah, yeah. helping counsel for me in, in this race and in the last one, um, said that, you know, I had a lot of support uh, from the folks over there and asked if I'd be a manager. You know, I, I know a thing or two about getting in some fights and coming <laughs> out on top, you know. And yep. so, so I, I, I agreed to do it, and I was with a, a brother's name is Isaiah. Uh, we were in our tournament, and um, man, it was it was awesome. You know, getting to getting to bounce off the ropes. You know, I'm reliving my childhood dreams. You know, thinking about Goldberg and, and Stone Cold. <laughs> you no, know, and uh, and. You know, I, I wasn't necessarily the biggest rock fan, but I respect the rock. You know, Undertaker, okay. all that guy. Um, yeah, it was it was awesome, man. I it's not a lot of Senate candidates that are getting in in the ring and appreciate wrestling. So uh, you know, I was I was excited to represent. That's awesome. I think you should just base your entire uh your entire campaign tour on which wrestling stops you can make. And I think you just make a gimmick of it and you just get over with everybody. But I will say I go to a lot of wrestling shows and it's really funny because the wrestlers, if you talk to them, they tend to lean more Democrat. But if you go talk to the people in the crowd, they tend to lean more Republican. And, you know, and then, but then I'm sure that you were able to, to turn some heads there, especially people who may not even have known you or thought you only by your, uh, your you know, being a Democrat. I bet, I bet you changed some minds there that night. Man, look, the, the crowd was crazy. So I, I would imagine that there were a few folks in there that were like, wait a minute, who, who, what's he doing in there? <laughs> look, man, it's, you know, if you're finding common buys, again, like when you, when you go into that in, that, in that arena and you're looking at the ring, it's not Democrats and Republicans, you know? And, and so we, we got to find those ways to remember that at the end of the day, we're connected. And uh, I'm here to tell that story and I'm happy to get in the ring for, for the people of Kentucky. I meet, love it. meet people where they are that's grassroots organizing at its best and i'll just say that uh i, I just i can't picture Rand paul getting in the ring so uh you know <laughs> challenge to him though challenge to him we'll see it uh that i i love that i think that's great uh charles booker love having you on it was it was great to talk to you again um very excited for your campaign for the election in kentucky i hope that everybody goes to your website checks it out and, and if they want to volunteer they can and uh we appreciate you coming on and and good luck brother i, I appreciate both of y'all thank y'all for what you do for fighting the fight and standing up for places like appalachia and i i'm gonna keep doing it too man i'm in it with y'all i love to hear All it right. take care I thanks love.